Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We pray that you, you would help us to receive that word into our hearts and into our lives this day. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I heard a story a while back about a soldier who was severely wounded to the point that he couldn't crawl out of the battle zone. And a uh, chaplain who was attached to their unit happened to see him and he, he crawled out to him and sort of did what he could to help him. And when the remainder of the troops started retreating, they somehow didn't see this soldier or the chaplain there. But the chaplain stayed with the wounded man. In the heat of the day, he gave him water from his own water bottle while he himself remained parched with thirst. In the night, when the frost came down, he took his own coat and covered the wounded soldier. And as it got colder that night, he took off some of his clothes and wrapped the soldier in those clothes to keep him from freezing to death. In the end, the wounded man looked up at the chaplain and said, Padre, you're, you're a Christian? The chaplain humbly said, well, yeah, I try to be. And the wounded man said, if Christianity makes a man do for another man what you have done for me, tell me about it, because I want it. Now, the soldier had likely, in his lifetime, had heard some sermons and, and had been witnessed to by some friends or family, and maybe he would even read his Bible. But what convinced him about the truth of Christ and Christianity was seeing and experiencing the love of Christ through the actions of a believer. Now, as Jesus said in John chapter 13, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, today's reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is often known as the love chapter. It's often read at weddings. But it's no accident that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is sandwiched between the content of 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about the gifts the Holy Spirit gives to each member of the body of Christ for their ministry. No, it's not just the ministers in the church that have the ministry, right? Each and every one of us as Christians have a ministry within and outside the body of Christ. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is a further explanation of the gifts the Holy Spirit gives to the members of the body of Christ for their ministry. So I like to call these three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, the love sandwich. The two slices of bread are the outer two chapters on the gifts the Holy Spirit gives you for ministry. But the meat of the sandwich that which is in the middle, that which is absolutely necessary, is love. Now, when I have a turkey sandwich, sometimes there's more bread than there is meat. You ever, you ever had a sandwich like that? You know? And, 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 uh, but the turkey is what makes the turkey sandwich. You don't call it a bread witch. <laughs> you call it a turkey sandwich, right? And uh, love is what makes the ministry from the body of Christ, from the church, from each and every one of us, that's what makes, that's what makes ministry delicious, appealing. The gifts the Holy Spirit has given you for ministry are vitally important, but without love, this ministry sandwich becomes tasteless, joyless, boring, and to some even nauseating. So without love permeating your ministries within the body of Christ, there is no appeal to those on the outside who want to taste and see, as the psalmist said, that the Lord is good. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, He said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and be trampled under people's feet. So you are to be salt. And what does salt do? It brings flavor. You are to be flavorful of the things of God in the community. And if you lose your appealing flavor to those who are in the world, 
You are no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So effective ministry for you, for your ministry, in your family, in your community, in your school, in your work, in your church, effective ministry is always, always motivated and accompanied by love. Now the first few verses in our reading from 1 Corinthians are at the end of chapter 12. Then we go into chapter 13. So verse 27 says, Now you, meaning you all, are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So there's a corporate sense and there's an individual sense. There is one body, but many parts. Now, earlier in verses 12 through 20 of chapter 12, Paul describes the body of Christ like your body. You know, an ear and an eye and a hand and a foot and a head, these various parts. So each part of your body, your physical body, is necessary. And though you may take certain parts of your body for granted, I guarantee you if you lost a foot or an eye or, or an ear or a, or a hand, I'm just thinking about Daryl, if he lost a hand, you know, he couldn't play piano. I mean, wouldn't that just be tragic? You know, if you lost a part of your body, you would, you would absolutely miss it dearly. Each and every part of your body is necessary. Verse 15 says that it would be sort of ludicrous for the foot to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Of course, of course you do. Verse 21 goes on to say that it would be equally ludicrous for the eye to say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or for the head to say to the feet, I have no need of you. It would be crazy, right? You need every part of your body. And in a similar way, each and every member of the body of Christ is different and unique and desperately needed for this body to do what God would have us to do. Verse 18 goes on to say, But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So we need each other. And God designed us that way. He designed us to need each other. You need me, I need you, we need each other. And when one part of the body of Christ despises another part of the body of Christ, then there's a, a cancer begins to spread. And it must be stopped. But when we see one another as absolutely necessary. Instead of putting each other down, we look at each other and say, man, that person sure is different from me, but man, they, they sure are needed, and I need them, and they need me. When we start thinking that way, then our mission to reach our families and friends for Christ, uh, this will make us productive and reproducing and healthy. Our ministry among each other and among non-Christians must be motivated by love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is about ministry motivated by love. Contrary to popular belief, it's really not about weddings. <laughs> it's not really about marriage. It's about ministry motivated by love. Verse 1, if I speak in, in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul thanked God that he spoke in tongues. And he even said, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. So, biblically, speaking in tongues is a good and godly thing. Yet, if this good thing is done without love, then it is a noisy distraction. A noisy distraction. Verse 2, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am... Anyone know what it says? Nothing. Anybody want to be nothing? <laughs> that sounds awful, right? I'm nothing. So hearing the voice of God is a wonderful thing. The Apostle Paul said that blessing others with a specific prophetic word from God is for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. 
However, if a word from God, a true prophetic word from God, encouraging word to somebody else, is mixed with your self-serving motivation or, or sort of condemnation of another person that you're ministering to, then, then love is obviously not present. And you gain nothing. You gain no reward. They aren't blessed. It's not a good situation. Now, understanding the intricate depths of the mysteries of the things of God, that's a wonderful thing. And being able to explain God's Word to others is a huge blessing. But if you gain great biblical understanding and have no love for those to whom you minister, you become like a judgmental Pharisee and you gain no reward from God and even face God's judgment. Trusting God to the point of, of receiving amazing miracles, miracles like the miracles that Jesus did, is a great blessing to the body of Christ and a, and a great witness to those who are without Christ. But if this miraculous ministry is motivated by, isn't, is not motivated by love, it is worth absolutely nothing and even brings disgrace on the church of Christ. So if I'm exercising an amazing ministry but have not love, I am nothing. Nothing. Verse 3, If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain... You want to say it with me? Nothing. <laughs> gain nothing. So if I give away all my wealth for the sake of the gospel like St. Nicholas did, and like St. Francis did, or if I sacrifice my entire life for the sake of others and for the sake of the gospel, and if I lay down my life as a martyr, but my sacrifices are not motivated by love to those to whom I'm ministering, then I gain nothing, they gain nothing, I receive no reward from the Lord, and I, I hear from the Lord, no, well done, good and faithful servant. So what does ministry motivated by love look like? Well, we find it in verses 4 through 7 in 1 Corinthians 13 from our reading today. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So first of all, ministry motivated by love is patient and kind. It's more concerned with the person than the process. It means entering into the mire and mess of your friends and your family members. It means not giving up on them, no matter how many times they fail or they fail you. It's not giving up. It's being patient and kind. Ministry motivated by love is not envious or boastful or arrogant. It's not concerned with bigger and better and getting the glory. That's not what ministry is about. Ministry motivated by love is not rude or irritable. Has anyone here ever been irritable? <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes we have bad days, you know. But if we really are about Christ's ministry to others, it can't be out of rudeness or irritability. It's not about putting sinners down. You know, those people who do these things. It's not about putting them down, but lifting them up with the love and truth of God. Ministry motivated by love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. So it's not about denouncing the hedonists and heretics. It's not about denouncing them, but proclaiming the truth in love. In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul tells us to speak the truth in... Anybody know? Love. Love. Okay, speak the truth in love. Now, there's one thing about speaking the truth. There's a lot of people out there on social media, the news, whatever, who at least from their perspective believe they're speaking the truth, but it's very different than speaking the truth in love. I mean, speaking the truth can be, 
can, can feel very abrasive, can be hurtful and harmful, but speaking the truth in love is totally different. So if your ministry, whatever your ministry happens to be, and we've all got one, if it is motivated by love, then you won't berate others. You won't sort of skewer them <laughs> with the sword of the Spirit. Rather, you'll get to know them and love them and with humility, maybe even tears, you will share the liberating truth of God's holy word. If not, as the Apostle Paul said, I gain nothing. I receive no reward and they aren't blessed either. So if you are to have an effective ministry, whatever that ministry you have might be, then you must be motivated by love. One of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes uh, comics, I don't know if any of you read Calvin and Hobbes, but uh, one of my favorite ones when the father of his son Calvin uh, arrives home and he parks the car in the driveway and he, he sees his son, he goes, uh-oh, you know, if, you, if you know Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes, this little kid, he's, he's like seven or eight years old. He's very mischievous, always getting into trouble. And his father says, uh-oh, his little son's got this sign. And he's smiling like, Dad, I love you. And the sign says, love the sinner, hate the sin. You know, like, like don't, don't give it to me, Dad. But, you know, deep down, I think both sinners and saints, we all feel the same way. We want to be loved in the midst of our imperfections, in the midst of our sins. We all want to be loved. As Anglican priest and author Rennie Scott so succinctly said, our greatest desire is to be known and loved. And our greatest fear is that if we were known, we wouldn't be loved. So let's shock our family and friends. Let's minister to them with self-sacrificial unconditional love. Amen.